some glyphs of the day. I'm always adding those. Uh, this is a hieroglyph law. It's very important. And it looks like an upside down sign for Lord and flowers. Uh, and, and, and that is a bit of a later uh, convergence. The earlier forms of the sign are quite different. And it's more often than not a double. So you don't read that as la la. It's just a single la. This is sign le. That actually represents a, a, a leaf of an aquatic plant, like a water lily. So you see images of pools of water with these things on the surface. So that's how we know it. Uh, but, but it's also a, a mammal of some sort showing you his tongue. I have no idea why. Nobody knows as far as I uh, am, aware, am, am aware of. And this is the syllable you that you've seen when we talked about pronouns quite a bit. And it represents breath, like volutes of breath. And it's also a sign for jewel that is closely linked to breath and uh, chest pectorals. And this is an earlier form that is more elaborate and uh, kind of gets stylized towards the end. And finally, this is the sign B that is easy to remember, means road. And it actually shows you the world, the cosmogram, four corners and center, and also the four roads of the sun, which, you know, the equinoxes and the solstices. So these are important signs. You'll see them quite a bit. You don't have to learn them, but it helps to build a vocabulary gradually. And I already showed you, uh, we, we, there was a question, right, about cross-hatching and blackness. So these are some examples. The logram, the main logram is ichak, which you can translate as claw or fingernail. But this is an example when uh, the notion in Mayan languages doesn't quite fit English or other Indian European languages because we distinguish between hooves, nails, claws, depending, I guess, on the shape or whether it's human or not. In my language, it's all each up. So that, you know, hard stuff that grows on the horse's hoof or animal's hoof or the claw of an animal or the fingernail or toenail, same thing, all each up, which I think is important kind of how language thinks, like how it classifies things. So it's all each up and you can see the logram itself shows us a jaguar paw with claws. Uh, and so these are jaguar spots when they are carved. Uh, and uh, when they're painted, they're just black. And uh, this is another sign, which is a ma. And it's also just black blobs. And when they're carved, they're cross hatched. So that's just a very basic convention of Maya uh, writing when it's incised or carved. There's no way to show blackness, so use cross hatching. I, rem I remind you of Maya vowels. We talked about spelling rules. They're short, long, and glottalized. It's very important that there's a lot of confusion about the nature of my glottalized vowels. So you can see people spelling with just short or long vowels. I often do that, not because it's fanatically accurate, but because I'm not sure. All I know is that my scribes distinguish between short vowels and other kinds of vowels. So just want to indicate that, and I'm not staying linguistically accurate. But some epigraphers choose to be more specific, so you can end up with different spellings like chen versus chen, or just short chen. I prefer just to be a little more consistent. So most of the time you see me spelling the word chen will be like this. Doesn't mean that it was pronounced that way. It means I'm just trying to avoid too much variation in reconstructed pronunciations. Um, we covered that. Ta ulahun becomes tu ulahun. Uh, and the same process uh, affects middle vowels in words when you add additional suffixes or prefixes. So they just disappear. They're not replaced by glottal stops, they just go away. So wahawal becomes wahwal or u. Uh, ukabashi becomes ukapsi. And you can see the last syllable sort of stressed. Uh, and, uh, and the middle one is the one that usually goes away. Right? So ukapsi, uh, yalhi, not yalahi. And, and of course, it, it doesn't help that this vowel is long. You yeah, can't have like two long vowels in the word. Uh, and, and so it is the one that probably shortens and then just goes away entirely. So we call it vowel reduction or elision, and it's a common process in many languages, including Mayan languages. Remember the pronouns. 
pronouns will be with you for the rest of this course because they come with verbs and nouns and you just have to know them and, and understand this difference between ergative and absolutive pronouns. Continuing with our Star Wars analogy, think of Yoda. He would say, sad I am, Jedi you shall be. Uh, let's practice, let's practice. So say you have a word, we knock, men. So, ah, we knock in. What does it mean? Ah, we knock in. So yeah, we knock person, you have a prefix ah, and you have a suffix in. Ah, we knock in. I am your man. your man. Well, literally, your man, me. Right? That's what the text actually says. Your man, me. Like very Yoda. You're a man, I am. Uh, so, uh, I am your man. Ha, wa, ha, wal. What is ha? As for him, wa, ha, wal. You see, there's like a zero at the end. Or as for her, as for them, wahawal. What is what? Is it a first person? First person. So as for him, my, oh. my wahawal. So as for him, he is my lord, he is my lord or she is my lord. Of course, there's no difference in my languages. What about uch amal with a zero at the end? Amal takes uch amal. He, she takes it or takes him or takes her. Of course, there will be no difference whatsoever. Him, her, it. It's all zero. Ni mamat. Ni mamat. Mom, grandson, or grandpa. Ni mamat. You are my grandpa. You are my grandpa. You are my grandson. Exactly. Huli. With a zero dent. Huli. He arrived. She arrived. It arrived. They arrived. Technically, would be huliob. They arrived. In plural. Hili yokel. Yokel. Okel is food. Hili rests. Hili yokel. He rests his foot. He rests his foot. That's, that's close. It's his foot, but not he rests. They or no, no. It's it's the 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 the, the, the it's singular and it's third person, but it's not he rests. It's his foot rests. His foot rests. So verb, subject. So his foot rests, or her foot rests, or its foot rests. What about wits with a zero? Wits. If you want to translate as a sentence, wits means mountain. But if a, imagine that it's a sentence. Wits. It is a mountain, exactly. Or you can say it is the mountain. There's no way to mark this distinction grammatically in uh, my languages, except by adding additional particles. Like, for example, ha, wheats. This, this is the mountain, right? With an emphasis using the independent pronoun. Because that's obviously not a mountain. Uh, sometimes uh, there would be like yaha in Turkey, like that for an emphasis. In, in Yucatec, there's a suffix a, so we say, like that mountain. Uh, ka, bull, bull are black beans. Ka, bull with a zero. Our beans, or because we have to imagine it's a sentence. These are our beans. <laughs> So it's, it's also important to remember that there's no verb to be in, in, in my languages. So uh, we have to imagine these sentences as if they had that verb, because uh, that's what you need in English. 
So uh, what I'm going to do in the remaining time is to discuss nouns. And I'm not, I'm not going to cover all of it. I'll only talk about how gender and plural are marked. And then I'll discuss possession. So gender and plural are relatively straightforward. As you remember, pronouns are genderless, right? Uh, and many my words are genderless. Plural is marked only occasionally, right? So, and there are two markers of plural. There is a generic ob plural, and there is a special plural that survives only in one modern Mayan language in Chorti, and it's tak. And in Chorti, it's only men, women, and children. Yushik tak, tehrum tak, mash tak. Uh, it's kind of interesting, right? It's very restricted. And it's not very, as we would say in linguistics, productive. Because uh, you cannot derive many plurals with it, only certain words. And that suffix seems to be used for basically animate, perhaps gendered entities in uh, Mayan inscriptions. But also very specific ones, and only human. So, chok tak, youths, ahau tak, lords. And you can always see whether or not someone is following up literature on like Mayan languages when they start saying ahawob, lords, which is a decent plural of the word in many Mayan languages, except the language of the hieroglyphs, where it's always ahau tak. So presumably you mark that word a house in some kind of special category. Some people suggest maybe it's just reverential plural, but that's not how it works in Chorti. Chorti is just gender that seems to define that, like explicitly gendered terms like male, female. Uh, that's, that's what makes it important. And children. Um, uh, this is plural, and it's a very strange statement. It's somebody summons lightnings. Tzak uh, kawilob. And you can notice that there's actually no O spelled. It's just a wheel with ba. It's one of those morphemic spellings, right? You're just supposed to like place the vowel yourself. So the writing a wheel o ba, as they do sometimes, the scribes just wrote ba. You don't have other options here to actually read it in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, so a wheel o So someone summons lightnings. Not just a single god of lightning, but presumably the spirits of lightning. Just imagine the scene, right? So from the Highlander, like the bolts of lightning come in all directions. Uh, that's, uh, and that's actually Queen at the side of Yashalan. She summons lightnings. Uh, and that's lintel of her palace. And this, of course, female, and you can mark female. You don't have to mark female. Usually it's specific when people discuss queens. And often with the royal titles as a way to indicate that this is not the queen, but rather the daughter of a king. And so it's very important to indicate that distinction, right? That your titles are by birth and not a marker of office. And so Lady Naman is in here, Naman Ni is not the queen of Naman, it's the daughter, as we would say, princess. There's really no term princess in Mayan text. We translate it because it makes sense contextually to call uh, these women princesses. They just say female lord of Naman. Or female Sahal and female person from Bikil. Uh, just a reference to a place. It's interesting that some of these may still refer to jobs. For example, when people are called priestesses, it's possible they are actual priestesses rather than daughters of a priest. There's no way to distinguish semantically between this, these things in, in, in uh, Mayan inscription, only from context. So Mark Zender, who wrote his dissertation on Maya priests, believes that a lot of these cases are actually priestesses rather than priest daughters. Uh, now, one big distinction between English and all of the Mayan language is that Mayan languages generally place a much greater emphasis on kinds of possession. So in English, there is no way to mark specifically the relationship between your body or someone else's body and what is being possessed. So grammatically, we're not separating things which are alienable from things which are inalienable. So say, the bone in my arm 
versus the bone in my arm, right? So in English, there is no grammatical way to mark it, only from context, and it's inherently ambiguous. The bone in my arm, the bone in my arm, my head, my head, right? Uh, but it extends to things that we necessarily do not consider part of our bodies, like earrings, necklaces, suggesting that once again, indigenous notion of what is part of you or what is you, right? What you are as a being, as an entity in this world is not entirely matching our own. Like we separate a lot of things away from our bodies and we assume that they don't have a life, they don't have a name and they don't make us who we are. It's different for the mind and it's reflected at, in the way they mark possession. So I'll go through these examples in, in some detail. So these are objects which are not supposed to be on their own. So when they are on their own, they require special suffix. And there is no good way of translating that difference in meaning from uh, into English. So we just sometimes do it in different ways. So for example, necklaces and earrings, they're supposed to be part of someone. And when they're not, they require a suffix. So when I see an earring on the road, Right? I cannot say tup, I say tupah. And, and my, whoever listens to me understands that I'm not talking about an earring on someone. Because if it were on someone, it would have to be possessed. It'd be like utup, and then I would actually name the person. Right? So this idea that there are certain things which have to be attached. And when they're unattached, it's unusual and it requires a marker. And it refers to tupah. Earrings, right? Gifts, gifts have to be given. Same thing. We say it's a gift. Like, am I a person? Would say probably it's my gift or it's your gift. But sometimes they could say a gift. And in, in, in translate, especially third person, all we have to do is all we are left with doing is like say this is a gift. Though that's not exactly what they're trying to say here, right? It's a gift that doesn't have a giver, or you don't know the giver. Uh, so, usih, his, her, its gift, their gift, and then sihach, a gift. Uh, necklace, actually anything that, that's basically hanging here. Oh, uh, doesn't have to be like a continuous string of beads. Same thing. And then image, same idea. When you think about it, right? Image is always of something. So you say, image. It's weird, right? I mean, it's even weird in English. This is an image. Uh, and so they can say, uba uhuntan. This is the cherished one of somebody. And that's how you, they describe child of, children of mothers. But they may also say, baha uhuntan. And in English, there is no way even to like, translate it differently. What's the difference between this is the image of someone's child or the image of someone's child? <laughs> like we always say off, there's no way to remove it and stay grammatical in English. But there is a way to do it in my language, but then you mark it grammatically as something else. And we don't quite understand what the distinction is between uba, someone's child versus baha, someone's child. But presumably there is a difference. It's one of those things when the languages, they don't really match entirely. There's this gap in understanding. It just always remains. Uh, so this is this class of things. And these are examples, right? So I say, necklace. Uh -huh. this, is all, this object is also uh -huh. Now, they have inscriptions on them, tags. And of course, all the tags are possessed. So this one says, you ha, you, his necklace. This one also says you ha, you, his necklace. And this one has utup, her earrings. And then of course the name of the owner, the name of the owner, the name of the owner. That's the natural state of things. 
that doesn't require special marking. It's when you remove them from the owner, when you talk about them without mentioning the owner, that's when you really have to emphasize that. Uh, there is a special possessive suffix uh, that is added to nouns, and it seems to distinguish special kinds of possession. Now, the traditional explanation is that some of it is supernatural, and the rest of it is uh, was they would say partitive relationship. It's like a specific example of something else. I am not fully understanding, and I'm not fully on board with it's actually true. But there seems to be a difference that adding a suffix makes. So say, my lord, when I say wahal, means my vassal. Wahwal means my superior. So both are possessions, but the meaning is the opposite. You cannot say my god. You cannot own a god. You cannot say nikuh. But nikuhul, yes, you can do. And that means, of course, my god in the sense that the god who owns me. The god I worship. The god who protects me. That's my god. But it's not possessing a god, right? It's something else. So this suffix essentially basically shows it's something else. Like you don't possess your superior officer. But you can say it's my superior officer, but you don't mean that. Right? And so that suffix basically helps you marking these kinds of possessions. Uh, Ula come to kneel. Some people say, well, it's specific rock. Like, like Lakamtun, big rock, stila. So a specific steel, not general steel. But it may also indicate the special nature of possession. Like you can't own a holy monument. In the same way, you cannot own a god. They have their own names, usually. They, they're like batteries concentrating the energy for the universe to go on for the next 20 years. So maybe they cannot be owned in the same way like your superior or your god cannot be owned. Uh, then you have uh, Anab, and we all, unfortunately have only one basic pair. So usually it's Anabil, and that's an artist who belongs to a patron and carves something for the patron's subordinate. And we see it on tombstones, for example, carved by artists from the royal court for the provincial rulers. But we have one example on that stalactite or stalagmite at Yashchalan when the term is anab and it's spelled differently. And, it, and there it is yanaba tzilitun, the anab of stone breaking. So obviously stone breaking is not the patron, it's the action. So anabil belongs to the patron. Anab that belongs to the action is presumably the person doing the action or sponsoring the action. So it's kind of the opposite relationship. So it seems that this suffix does this, you know, symbolic switch or semantic switch between who owns whom. This ambivalence of possessive statements or possession statements that we see in English, right? As you say, my lord, what it means, my vassal or my superior. So my languages deal with that by adding this suffix and it allows to distinguish between these inherently ambiguous options. Kinship terms have no markers, whether they're possessed or unpossessed. Uh, in the language of hieroglyphic inscriptions. So they're all the same, whether it's kinship terms on their own or with a possessive prefix. So for example, yal, child of mother. And then this is one of my favorite terms that you can translate as mommy's boy, right? Ba, like principal, al, mother's child. Atan, spouse, wife. Yatan, his, her, uh, wife. Uh, Yunen, child of father. Unen, child of father. And we see it in names. Child of father Jagra, for example. Ishunen Balam. Lady, child of father Jaguar. But it's not, it's not like child of the Jaguar. It's more like baby Jaguar. Right? So you can use Unen as unpossessed, which can generic sense of like child. And then you have a next group of words which is similar, but the specific like body parts. And they also take a suffix when they're not possessed. Kind of makes sense, right? Uh, so you have ol when it's possessed, it's yol. When it's unpossessed, it's olis. Uh, spelled as ola si, confusingly. Ut or hut, i, ut, utis, when it's not possessed. Uh, tab, Arm, 
abyss when it's not possessed. So the idea is that these are things which are inherently possessed, right? And when they're not possessed, they require a special suffix, just like the examples with like Bach and Bachach, except this is more closely body parts, right? Like physical body parts, you're part of your body, attached to it. Like an, an, an earring has to be possessed, but you can take it off, right? It's much harder to take your arm off. And it's interesting that this category includes things that we would interpret naturally as body parts, but they're also things which are a little, not quite what we would think as body parts. So Yais is demon. It's the spirit that lives in you and you can release upon your enemies at night. But because they live in someone, they cannot exist on their own indefinitely. They always require host. Therefore, Yais requires the is suffix because they're actually body parts. They're hard gods, gods that reside in your heart, but not in your like physical heart, not the, the thing that pumps blood, but the spiritual center it, re responsible for emotion. So these are gods of emotion, of heart, of volition. So it's a category of deities in my uh, religion, hard gods, olis, oh. When you talk about them generally, right? Not about gods of my heart or his heart or her heart, but as a category, hard gods. Uh, all these uh, teeth, mouth, kind of hard to imagine unpossessed mouth, but you can say like, what a mouth or something. And then you have, you know, you require that. So, and these are possessed forms. Someone's demons, someone's mouth, someone's heart, once again, spiritual heart, not physical heart. And just to give you a sense, right, this is Ba or Baha when it's unpossessed, image, and this is Bahis, someone's head when it's not possessed. So you understand the difference, right? This is Baha, this is Bahis, they're both Ba's, but this one, the idea is that it used to be attached to something. And of course, there are plenty of images of Bahis in my art, which are no longer attached. And this one has some stuff coming out, kind of very obviously, so recently detached. Uh, so Baha, Bahis. And of course, both you can see Uba, like this is image of a god. And well, this is Uba, someone's well, I'm less fortunate uh, captive, probably. That, huh. Bunny pot has one of the beautiful examples of unpossessed body parts. Remember, he recommends uh, the old god to strike his head and, well, smell his arse. And then he calls him Kulis Itzamat. And is, of course, is the suffix of unpossessed body parts. Because when you call someone a dick, it's an unpossessed body part. The word kur is still used among the Chorti Maya, so there's a direct cognate. Uh, and it means the same thing. Not a socially acceptable term for a female, uh, for male, you know, reproductive organ, which happens to be the name of this god. His name is Itzamat, magic penis. So he actually calls him dick magic penis. So strike your head, smell your arse, dick magic penis. And the fact that they're using a non-possessed suffix, uh, body part suffix, makes clear that that's what they mean. I mean, that's what the bunny means. And it's interesting that the word is spelled syllabically because, of course, it's a highly abstract concept. It's not about body parts. It's about attitude. There is no abstract symbol of dickiness. You can't depict it. No matter how hard you try, it's different. It's contextual. So that's why phonetic characters are always so useful because they allow you to express thought to the depth only available to the speakers of a language, right? So you can actually call someone a dick. That's what real writing is for. The uh, somewhat different category of possession is when uh, the basic possessed form does not necessarily imply that it's a body part, but there is a special suffix that narrows down 
to basically saying, yes, it's a body part. So the best example would be the bone, right? Imagine there is a bone and you are, if you are a Maya, you live in a culture when people use bone a lot as a material. There are weaving bones, there are drilling bones, there are weapons made out of bones. Uh, and all of those bones, they're not part of anyone's body, but they can be possessions. So when you say Nibak, it can mean my bone, it can also mean my captive, because of course people make trophy bones out of captives, so they call captives bones. Uh, kind of metonymy of sorts. Uh, and then there is a bone that's actually part of someone's body. So you can say, Ubak Nibak, the bone of my captive, like the captive is holding a bone. Or you can say, Ubak El Nibak, this is the bone of my captive. It sounds like I made a bone out of my captive. I'm holding it. So that is a very useful distinction. And it seems to extend to things that, uh, while well, they can be possessed separately. Curiously, the word for a skull, head, is in this category. So it's very easy to say, Niho, like my head, and would mean, well, my head that I'm holding, uh, as opposed to Niho Lil, which would be like my head, like my skull, uh, as opposed to like Ba, which would be like head and everything on it, like headdress and stuff. Hold is more specifically like the skull. Uh, and of course, it shows a trophy head, like a deflashed skull. That's pretty much the idea. So this is a classic of my reference to a massive slaughter of enemies uh, during a battle between the side of Dos Pilos and the side of Tikal. And they say, Hubui utok upakal. It goes down with a zero, it's an intransitive verb to go down, to fall. Utok, utok, his flint or their flint, upakal, their shield. Remember, it's a couplet that refers to weapons of war and armies. Nunu Holchak. Nunu Holchak is the rival king of Tikal, an arch enemy. So his weapons, his flint and his shield go down. Witsich, become the mountain. Uholil, Nahbach, Uchichel, become uh, the mountain. Their heads, skulls, become the lake, Nahbach, Uchichel, their blood. Ushlahunzuk Mutul, the 13 divisions of Tikal. So they, they, they basically slaughtered all their enemies and now their blood became the lake and their skulls piled like a mountain. Uh, a pretty, pretty brutal statement of what they did. So of course here they're really talking about the blood of these people. It's not like they captured a bunch of like buckets of blood and pull them. So this distinction is helpful in terms of how you try to describe relationships of possession. And this is perhaps one of my final examples uh, from the side of Yashilan. The king and the queen of Yashilan were buried with a set of gift bones. And those are bones you may remember for bloodletting and they're shaped like idols of the gods. So you literally put blood on them and the blood can flow into the mouth of the God. Very, very efficient. Uh, and so this bone depicts the God, Kochak, and it's the bone of the queen, but the caption says, U ba ke le balam ma, and then ish kabal shok, the jaguar bone of Lady kabal shok. So the fact that the word El is here and balam is inserted between the, the owner of the bone, means that this is the Jaguar's bone of Lady Kabal Shok, right? So Jaguar here is what they made the bone from. So if it were simply Ubak, Ish Kabal Shok, that'd be like the bone owned by Lady Kabal Shok. If it were Ubakil, Lady Kabal Shok, that would mean that that's actual bone of Lady uh, Kabal Shok. And this is an example of one uh, which is just a uh, bone. So, Tok Alahau, Flint Lord or Flinty Lord, U Mahil Bak, without the suffix, Ish Kabal Shok, the gifting bone of Lady uh, Kabal Shok. So, here, 
la la uh, lady, her name is like Handy Shark, a bad shark. I guess it'd be like fish fin, like that. That sounds like like finny shark. Uh, uh, and it's actually her family name. She had a separate name, Lady Sacrifice the God Shark. Um, and and a bad shark. Apparently, her sisters were a bad shark. Her dad was a bad shark. They're all bad shark. That's like a that's like a yeah, like we call a surname. Um, so in this case, she just owns the bone. Right? It's not part of her body. And they don't specify what it was made of, as in here. Presumably not all of these bones were made of jaguar. And they felt like they really had to point that out. That was real jaguar's bone. But other bones, of course, can be used as tools. And that's very important. So we have canoe bones. This one is a weaving bone. U, pu, tsi. And that's just a new sign, which is a little strange. U puts e baki, the weaving bone. Puts weave back bone, the weaving bone. So there are all kinds of tools, which are all bones, of course. And so that special suffix is really required to mark possession. And this one is also one of my favorites. Uh, this is an actual human humerus. And it says so, u bakel ukit akan. The bone of Ukita Khan. This is his bone, and we actually know that uh, it was uh, with the son of Ukita Khan. So he owned his dad's bone, he kept it as a relic. Uh, so the inscription, of course, just identified it, right? Uh, and, and it's also important, right? Because in this case, the text confirms that this is uh, the bone of the king. I guess we would say like a holy relic. And of course, it's not so uncommon. If you go to a European Catholic church, there'll be plenty of bones displayed sometimes in very important uh, places uh, and provided with inscriptions just like this one. Except, of course, if you worship your own ancestors, that there is nothing better than a part of your ancestor. So you could, you could basically offer your prayers and touch your ancestor and, and connect to the spirit of the ancestor better. There is nothing better than an actual piece of an ancestor uh, to connect to the spirit of the ancestor. And so this, this statement, once again, helps you understand the relationship between the possessor and the possessed. So all of these categories, they're really absent in English, right? And there are three important things here, perhaps, or maybe more. One is that there is this distinction between possessed and unpossessed states. One of them is marked but not necessarily the possessed or the unpossessed. It varies, right? So we have terms which are inalienable possessions, and therefore it is the unpossessed state that is marked. Then we have inalienable possessions, which are really part of someone's body. And then the unpossessed state of those things are marked. And then we have possessions, which may or may not be parts of someone's body. And it is the cases when they are which are less common, that are actually marked. And I think what is also interesting is that the notions of what is part of one's body is not overlapping with ours. So like image is inalienable from the owner, but so are earrings and a necklace. And then, of course, body parts, they also include what we would call animistic entities, the things that reside in your body. So hard gods, for example, the fact that they use this prefix on unpossessed hard gods implies that a heart cannot exist outside of your body. This is a kind of spiritual entity that is tied to you while you live. Once you die, the heart is gone. Outside of your body, it cannot exist. The same goes to the demons of the night. They are creatures. They are depicted as creatures in Maya art. And we'll talk more about them. But same idea. They always have a host. And uh, in contemporary ethnographies, they switch from one member of a particular family to another member. So if someone dies, they essentially seek someone to move in. And then they move in into that person, usually a baby. And, and so the idea is that, once again, they cannot exist on their own. So if you see one, 
it's an unnatural state. It means you're being attacked, basically, but not by the demon, by the owner of the demon, right? Uh, so it's like being, you know, falling victim to a spell or some kind of hostile act. And the demon is just the tool, the instrument. There's always an owner behind it. Uh, or a family, in case of the Maya, a lot of these things are owned not by individuals, but by families. So perhaps specific volition of a person is less important. What really matters is who owns that demon. And believe it or not, you'll see there are lists of these creatures on classic Maya drinking cups. So when people feast, when they celebrate, they're looking at lists of evil spells they can use against each other. And I don't know what the best analogy would be. It's just like, I know, imagine like a big state banquet full of nuclear countries and each cup and plate is decorated with like nuclear journal, <laughs> with like quantities of like how much stuff they have, you know, you know, just in case. But that's pretty much the idea, right? People basically say, this family can kill you with the death on the road. That family has an evil pocket golfer they can send after you to chop your head off. Uh, that family will make you die from thirst. And so fascinating, right? In terms of imagining the world of sorcery, sort of hidden Maya warfare, witchcraft, which I'm sure was happening uh, as, 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 as well as more obvious kinds of warfare. And I'm sure if you were a member of the Maya noble family, you had to learn these things to recognize the symptoms and know who to blame if something happens to you. Right? And some of these creatures are winds, for example. So some families could send winds. Some families could send earthquakes. The imperial family of Kano, their names are Yuknom, literally earthquake maker. And their demon is Chichan, the deer snake that causes earthquakes and floods with its body and its deer horns. So they literally claimed that they had that power, right? That they could destroy cities. And you kind of wonder how it came to be, whether it was a historical accident, but it's, it makes sense that the, the, one of the most powerful royal families also claimed one of the greatest powers, right? The power over earth, uh, according to the Maya demonology.